Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, the Reverend Amy Heller. Mother Amy is the senior chaplain at the Episcopal School of Dallas and served as associate rector of Church of the Transfiguration, chaplain to the school at Parish Episcopal, and I first met Amy when she was here as an associate for adult formation. We're fortunate to have her back with us tonight. Please welcome the Reverend Amy Heller. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a delight to welcome you all to St. Michael and All Angels. And before I introduce our panelists, let us be and share a mo be in prayer and share a moment of uh, quiet as we gather our thoughts together to build community in this evening we share. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of our human family and our ability to bear your image to one another. We thank you for our individuality and our shared holiness that moves in and through us into our world. Tonight in our time together, may our hearts and minds be open to listening to one another and to a renewed understanding of the many ways your holy people live their faith in you. Bless us with a holy curiosity, a heart of compassion, and a sense of shared life. To you, O oh Lord, be all honor and praise this night and always. Amen. Amen. Well, it's a wonderful to welcome our panelists this evening. Beginning to my right, um, Rabbi St uh, David Stern, Chief Rabbi at uh, Temple Emmanuel here in Dallas. In center, Imam Omar Suleiman, Director of the Islamic Learning um, Foundation of Texas and resident scholar at Valley Ranch Islamic Center. And at the far right, Reverend Dr. Chris Garada, Rector here at St. Michael and All Angels. It's, um, Fun for me to learn that they are getting to know one another and building their collegial relationships with one another. And so we really have an evening ahead of us of listening in on their conversations as they grow in um, friendship and fellowship with one another in the different uh, ways that they serve faith communities in our shared city. So as we begin, I have an opening question for you all. The question is this, what is a commonly held misconception of your tradition and what would you like us to know? about that commonly mis <laughs> misheld conception. And we'll go from there. I would never presume to answer first, <laughs> being that this is St. Michael. I thought that was your answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, commonly held misconception. Um, I would say commonly held misconception might be that the Jewish community is in some way monolithic um, in either its political or spiritual attitudes. And uh, as any Jew will tell you, the, the joke that Jews, we Jews like to tell about ourselves is uh, two Jews, three opinions. <laughs> um, which is not only a joke, but sort of an ethos mm -hmm. that uh, <laughs> Judaism is built on a spirit of argument and multiplication of ideas. So I would say any impression of the Jewish community that veers towards the monolithic is probably missing something central about who we are and uh, how we roll. Thank you. Well, I don't think anyone has any misconceptions about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Media does a great job of representing us. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I start? Do I just list them? Like <laughs> sort of bullet points? Um, there is less than, you know, we make up less than 1% of the population here in the United States, and we have not secretly launched a takeover of the country. Um, we're not trying to replace the Constitution with Sharia law. We don't want to kill everybody. Um, we're just as curious as to where ISIS came from as everybody else is. Um, we don't oppress. Uh, women in our tradition, or our tradition is not one that I'll, I'll, I'll use that one. Okay. Uh, that, that's the, that's the one. That's 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 the one I'll focus on just for a moment. And I think it plays into a larger narrative that Islam is a cause of destruction and regression. 
And I'd like people to just take a moment to consider that we are a 1,400-year-old religion and that within Islam, you had the birth of hospitals and medicine. The first university in the world was founded by a Muslim woman. Mm -hmm. um, our country here in the United States has yet to elect a woman president. The largest Muslim country in the world. Does anyone know what the largest Muslim country in the world is? Indonesia. Indonesia. Mm -hmm has already had two female uh, prime ministers. So um, associating Islam with regression, particularly the oppression of women and holding women back where some of the greatest female scholarship has been produced from the Muslim world over the last 1400 years, um, I think is very uh, dishonest and disingenuous. So I think Islam being associated with regression and particularly within that regression, the oppression <coughs> of women. We'll talk about the other stuff later. Sure, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'd probably say one of the common misconceptions would be that Christians are judgmental, that we seek only to convert or change anyone we meet. I mean, I, I have conversations all the time, especially with those who don't belong to a faith community, that they're afraid to show up at a church because they assume that we we'll kind of get our claws in them and want to make sure that they change who they are in order to be the kind of person God wants them to be. And I think it's so much bigger than that. It's more invitational than it is um, judgmental. It's a commonly misheld misconception, I think, of the faith. It may not be a misconception of the people. Mm. Um, <laughs> 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 That's fair. That's fair. 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 That's fair. <laughs> All right. I think, again, I'll open ended as to who wants to respond first. But it's a wonderful question that came ahead of time um, from some of, someone out here. Um, do we pray to the same God? It's a good softball, Amy. Yeah. I just thought I'd go there first. <laughs> I love it. Theological. So, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll start on this one, that um, the name Allah uh, is actually the same name, word that is used in the Arabic Bible. It's what Arab Christians, believe it or not, Arab Christians say Allahu Akbar, yep. mm -hmm. um, which means God is uh, greater. Uh, so the, the name Allah refers to what Jesus, peace be upon him, would have said Eloi or Ilah. Uh, refers to the same God of Moses. Uh, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. And so we have a, an understanding in our faith, at least, that we are, not only are we calling upon the same God that Jews and Christians call upon, but in fact, the Quran says when you speak to, um, when you speak to the people of the book, there, if you guys look up, there was an interfaith initiative called the Common Word that was initiated a few years ago. Started between Muslims and Catholics and spread. Uh, it's based on a, 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 uh, a verse in the Qur'an which says, say, O people of the book, which refers to the Jews and the Christians, uh, come to a common word that we worship our God, and your God and our God is one. Ilahukum wa ilahuna wahid. Your God and our God is one. So in Islam, we have a very clear understanding that we are in fact calling upon the same God of Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. May peace and blessings be upon them all. Thank you, Imam. I mean, I would just echo to say that we all, I think, understand that our Abrahamic root is the same. And although in every tradition, not just the three defined here, but as Rabbi Stearns already said, there are different branches within each of these groups, that it's branches off of that same root and the way that we understand the creator may be different but that the creator is the same. I would echo that and, and say that um, it's probably an act of human hubris to put the master of all the universe in a definitional box of human creation. So I would echo what my colleagues and friends have said by saying that it is in fact in some ways a uh, violation of God's sovereignty to treat God's sovereignty too narrowly uh, and 
that it's fundamental to my sense of faith to say that there is one God that we find different paths to, that we have different expressions of, um, that change within our own traditions over time, that are different in any one moment across a society, uh, and it seems to me fundamental to a monotheistic conviction to say that, of course, we do. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, keeping in that vein, and maybe we're going we're gonna to wander through history a little bit, um, why is it that um, each of the religions that you serve and that we are a part of um, focus on differences and not similarities? I answered first the last time. Yeah, it's Chris's turn to go first, actually. (laughs) I think it's human nature to try and define yourself by saying what someone else is or is not. Mm. That that's, that's normal, natural. I think that it's not perhaps the most mature way to do it, but very understandable. And so I think over time, it has, you think within Christian denominations, right? So, so many, hundreds and hundreds. Every time a church splits, it's because someone thinks that they know something right that the other people do not know. Or they believe that they can somehow agree on stuff that this other group cannot agree on. And I think, you know, it's difficult to ever say, if your starting place is that we're all going to agree on everything, I think you sort of fail at the start. Um, To kind of link back to what we've already discussed, I always feel like God is always bigger than anything we can ever understand. That our task is to try, and it's that effort to try that helps shape us over time. But to presume that we have figured out that God is this box is, is just a fallacy. I, um, I treasure difference, treasure distinctiveness, the same way I would want my children to treasure distinctiveness and not have to blend into some mm-hmm. great homogenized whole. Um, I think the challenge is to affirm difference without letting that difference lapse into hostility or antagonism. Mm-hmm. But it seems to me that identity, either individually or communally, depends upon acts of distinction and I think strives for distinctiveness. So that doesn't, doesn't mean we don't recognize commonality across those distinctions, but um, I treasure it. Mm-hmm. You know, in, the, uh, in, in our faith tradition, we have a recognition of a few layers of brotherhood. So first, there is one of the early Islamic scholars, uh, Al-Ghazali, uh, recognized a few different layers of brotherhood. So he said, first, there's the Adamiya, the, the children of Adam, the brotherhood and sisterhood amongst the children of Adam, that there is a universal brotherhood that exists there. And then it becomes Ibrahimiya, Abrahamic, that there is another closeness or a distinction of Abrahamic uh, brotherhood, those who, 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 uh, who claim um, uh, the father Abraham. Uh, peace be upon him. And then there is the brotherhood within Christ in Islam and that Muslims also affirm a position, a unique distinction position of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And then there is al-Muhammadiyya, which is the Muhammad, those who believe in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, affirming a brotherhood amongst themselves. But then it's really interesting because these obviously get closer and closer and closer and there are differences even amongst the followers of, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But the verse in the Qur'an, and every time I get asked what my politics are, uh, I say that there's one verse in the Qur'an that sums up my politics. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have honored and dignified the child of Adam. And so the children of Adam are to be dignified. When there are political agendas at play, division is the tool of people in power to distract to distract you from from actually focusing on what's keeping society down. So division is a very, it's very easy to point to someone who's different than you and say, that's your problem, not me. And if you figure that problem out, then everything will suddenly disappear. And so, in, you know, I don't want to get too political here, not yet at least. I, I want you guys to like me at least for the first 30 minutes. 
Because <laughs> once I start getting too political, then it's... <laughs> but what I would say is that that's where, that's where sectarianism, that's where division becomes uh, ripe, is when there is an agenda at play and there's something to be gained from dividing people. And it's just a simple question that we should ask. Who benefits from our division? Who benefits from this idea of a clash of civilizations? Um, extremist groups here and abroad of different faiths and flavors all, all uh, you know, uh, are able to fester because of these, th this, this idea that, that civilizations are at constant, in constant strife and that two groups of people cannot get along and so we have to always be in strife and always be fighting the other so that we don't actually rectify ourselves. And I'll follow that thread. We often talk about differences as problematic. And so, when I've been to interfaith discussions like this, or even interdenominational, ecumenical, or anything like that, it does seem like there's a tendency to want to reduce things down to the most common denominator, right? right. So, to try and go water it down and distill it down as far as we can so that we're all the same, rather than acknowledging the differences and then seeking to understand them. And it's that lack of understanding of the differences that exist that I think actually causes a lot of the mistrust yeah. and the growth of hatred and perhaps even allows people like us to, to allow, I suppose, that kind of hate and bigotry and intolerance to, I hate to say thrive, but maybe. Well, I I do, so I'll be political so you don't have to be so, but I think the um, part of the, part of what the current cultural climate does, I think, is give disagreement a bad name. Because um, difference and distinction means disagreement, and disagreement, again, can be a very healthy engine if it's in a healthy society. Uh, Omar and I, you know, we we have lots of serious and deep conversations with one another as colleagues and friends, and there are things we agree on clearly and there are things we disagree on clearly. Those disagreements are precious to me. Um, they help me clarify my own thinking. They force me to develop empathy for the thinking of someone for whom I have boundless regard. Um, and so I think that the problem is that now that everything is so toxic, we become afraid of disagreement, mm -hmm. right? And that's to our own detriment. And so um, I would echo what you're saying, Chris. I think that the, the, the lowest common denominator thing is not only misrepresentative and dull, it's dangerous mm -hmm. because it, it casts disagreement somehow as kryptonite and thereby limits our capacity to understand each other. Okay, so I want to be a little more personal and reflective for each of you for a moment. In your tradition and in your faith identity, what is the most beautiful or loving part of that that you value the most, just in your personal identity as, a, as, your, as a, the faith that you live? What is it that you say, when I wake up in the morning, this is what I love about being who I am and the faith that I hold dear? You shall love the stranger for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. Can you say a little bit more for people? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not the sound guy. <laughs> Again, Rabbi Stern. <laughs> if I had a church voice, I'd use it. Uh, uh, you shall love the stranger for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Uh, the reminder that the recognition of the dignity and the divinity inherent in the other is at the core of the Jewish covenant with God. Um, that is a source of pride and beauty to me. And as Chris said earlier, that doesn't mean um, there's always a difference between the doctrine and how it's enacted by complicated communities. That doesn't mean that we get it right um, all the time. I wouldn't even try to guess a percentage of the time that we get it right. But that is a horizon of decency and justice and holiness for me that I, am, um, that I feel blessed that it shines a light on my way. So... Um I would, from at the theological level, the uh, I would say clarity. As as a, as a Muslim, there's there's great clarity in our theology, 
as to who God is, what his attributes are. We begin everything that we do in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. That's how we, there, there's a very personal relationship that we're able to develop with God. And so we call upon him in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. There's also a connection um, to, to a, a multitude of prophets. So I, you know, I, when, when I speak to someone who is Jewish, um, I learn as they are speaking about the Old Testament and some of the stories of the prophets that came before because in my tradition we affirm those prophets. And when we speak of, of Jesus Christ, uh, peace be upon him, then I, have, then, then I can relate to that. I take great interest in, in who he was and what his mission was and, uh, and, and have something to relate to there. So there is a, there's, this, there's a wholesome uh, theological clarity, but then at the societal level, um, Islam has a, a very clear social justice tradition. It's a liberation theology at its core. Uh, that's, that, that's what's made it appealing um, to many of the uh, great civil rights leaders and activists that, we, that, we, that we've had and enjoyed in this country and elsewhere. There's, a, there's, a great, there's an explicit anti-racism tradition. The last sermon of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was, uh, or the second sentence of that last sermon, was that there's no superiority of a white man over a black man or of an Arab over a non-Arab. There's an explicit um, anti-racism tradition. There's an explicit tradition of treating people uh, with dignity and with honor and with love and compassion, even if they don't belong to your faith. So there, it, it's, it's the, how pristine those concepts are. And we can find a lot of those concepts that are under, you know, they're at the core of our messages of loving the neighbor, do to others what you would want to be done to you. Those are things, but I'd say this, that um, I often find that, that a lot of the things that people think about Muslims are actually true about Christ, or true about Moses, or true about, what I mean by that is that I think that the sanitizing of Christ, the sanitizing of Moses, the sanitizing of these great prophets, um, you know, and, and I say peace be upon them, and it might annoy, annoy you sometimes, but that we, we say that after the name of, of the prophets and, and, and uh, consistently, that Jesus was a man that was radically devoted to justice. Um, and I can appreciate that. And yes, yes there's turned the other cheek, but there's also, there's also a, a, a Jesus... Um, that was angry when there was injustice and that spoke out against it. And I think that when you look at the prophets of God, they were not, they were not pacifists in the sense that they did not take a passive attitude towards the injustice in their societies. They were not merely men of theology, but their theology transformed their societies and they were able to connect that to the vulnerable. And prophets were never popular with power structures. <laughs> mm -hmm. So... That's true. You know, power structures always appropriate and commodify prophets, but they were never popular with power structures. And so, to me, that's what I can draw from, that explicit social justice tradition that's amplified in the lives of all of those prophets as they're told within the Islamic corpus. Thank you. I think in, for Christian, different Christian groups, there are moments in the story of Christ that seem fundamental, like perhaps the number one most important. And that's perhaps shifted for me some in my life, but in my, as an adult, what has meant most to me is the idea of the incarnation, right? When Christ was incarnate in the world, God came into the world present in this person of Jesus of Nazareth. There's so much that can be done with that idea, so much richness that we can understand about God's compassion and love and presence, faithfulness, but where I think that impacts me is in the social sense of every person in this room, God's incarnation happens with each one of us in small ways, that we have God in us, right? That Godness is something that comes in us period. It's not something we can lose. And there are plenty of Christian traditions, I think, and theological ideas that sort of starts with we are bad and need to become good. And I think that there's plenty 
that says that we are good and lose our way, and that there's this constant return and turning and reconciliation that happens on our journey. And it's that turn and repentance over and over and over again because God's in us. And it's an inconvenient truth for me as a Christian that God is in every person because I don't like every person. (laughs) And even the people who cut me off on the street or who yell at me or who do frustrating things or who hurt other people, you name it, God's still there somewhere, could be so, so buried. But we're called to love God and love our neighbor. And we're called to love our neighbor because God's in there somewhere. And it's through the love that we share with one another that we help that kind of blossom and shine. That's great. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, as, as, we, as I notice the time, I believe the women of St. Michael will be collecting those questions, so pass them to an end, I think, this way. Um, and you know, th- then we'll have a second round of our questioning um, in process. But we have plenty, plenty to talk about and wonder about together. Um, I'm mindful of the fact that we are all people of books, one book, a holy book that is central to the story. Um, And of course, how we read our sacred texts is very important. And so um, I'm just wondering sort of the approach, the literal approach, the metaphorical approach. How does each tradition speak to the reading of sacred texts, whether through worship or study? And how is that, um, how might there be differences amongst uh, the different faith traditions? or even better to understand similarities. In the big Christian pantheon of (laughs) denominations, there are so many answers to that question. Mm -hmm. Um, As an Anglican Christian, Episcopalian, Anglican Christian, we root ourselves in scripture first and then develop from scripture through our tradition. And then we welcome in the idea of reason So our actual experience, our faithful experience in the world is meant to also inform how we live. So scripture is central. It is the beginning. But I think there are lots of Christians who have start from a place of literalism. And I will tell, I tell my Bible studies and groups that I don't think that it's good to read the Bible literally I would much prefer that you read it literately. Mm. And that reading it literally is what most don't do because most haven't actually read the whole thing. And it's not until you see how grand it really is that I think you can appreciate the complexity. It is just, it's not possible to read our, both the Old and New Testaments, literally, because they literally contradicted themselves throughout the texts, right? And so that those kinds of specific contradictions are okay, so long as you are a literate reader and a faithful reader. I like to tell children when we give them copies of the Bible that it isn't a book, but it's really a library of books and that you can't simply go front to back as if it's chapter one and chapter two of one nice novel. But instead, it's this rich, incredible, poetic and narrative and historic collection of different stories that sort of turn the crystal of truth. And you can't just ever pick one verse and say that is everything. Although people do it all the time, right? You can find a verse in the Bible to defend pretty much anything. That's not a literate understanding. And so it's incumbent upon us to go at it as both intellectual, but also faithful, and to let it speak to us over time and to continue to read it all the time. But I'm going to guess that more Christians than not have never read the whole thing. And that's probably a good place to start. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. 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 
So there was a social experiment uh, where you guys can look it up online. There's a person, I believe it was done in the Netherlands, who uh, took a copy of the Bible but wrapped it with a cover of the Quran. Oh, I've and seen that. You've seen that? Oh, right? yeah, it's took great. It to yeah. the street and you said, should look this up. Read this, read this verse from the Quran, and people would read it and go, oh, my God, that's, I can't believe it says that. They are, they are who we thought they were. That's right. Right? <laughs> and then... <laughs> yeah. And he takes off the, uh, the wrapper and shows it's a Bible. And um, so it's, it's actually quite, and this is, so as Muslims, we believe in the original format of those texts as they were revealed to, their, to, to the prophets. Again, we hold all of these uh, people as prophets and, and there were original revelations that over time, different translations and different versions uh, may have departed from the original text. But uh, it's really interesting because um, and, and I'm just going to, this is in defense of my faith, and, 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 you know, David, you know how much I love you, so don't get offended by this, all right? <laughs> but um, if, statistically speaking, if you take the verses of violence from the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Quran, the percentage of the Old Testament, don't get mad. I'm not mad. All right. <laughs> Let's keep this. Yeah. It's like 5.8%. The New Testament was 2.8. The Quran was 2.3. So we're, we're pretty, you know... Closer. <laughs> but we win, you know. <laughs> but but it's, it's, it's interesting to me because Islamophobes and extremists preach the exact same Islam. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. The president and, and, you know, some of those people, they, they sound exactly alike when they talk about my religion. I'm like, you guys should get in a room and talk about your Islam. And can you keep it somewhere? And can we build a wall and keep you guys on one side so that... <laughs> The rest of the 1.8 billion Muslims in the world can keep practicing the way they've been practicing. The Quran is to us the word of God. It is, uh, it, it is the literal word of God to us. So it's, it's a little different in that sense from a the theological perspective, the, the role that the Quran plays in the life of the Muslim. For 1400 years, it's been preserved in its original text. There are no versions of the Quran. And Muslim, Muslims throughout history have intentionally uh, maintained the original recitation of the Qur'an in Arabic. And that's why, though there are many translations of the Qur'an, and it was translated into Persian by one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, still there was this insistence, sort of like Syriac Christianity, mm -hmm. right? The Persian yep. church in the 4th century and 5th century recited in, you know, in, in Syriac to stay as close to uh, the Aramaic of Christ, peace be upon him. So there's this insistence on the originality of the text and maintaining the text and reading the text as it is. And that's part of the beauty of it in that uniformity that you can have a child in, in China or a child in Somalia and they're all reciting the exact same uh, Quran. So for 1400 years, there's that consistency that's there with the Quran. It's about 600 pages. It is memorized by millions of people around the world. It's memorized by thousands of people in Dallas. You're scared. Oof. Thousands and thousands of people that memorize the Quran word for word here in Dallas, Texas, right? That's or maybe hundred. No, we got thousands. I think we got thousands. We got a lot of a lot of schools here. Um, I shouldn't have said that, right? That's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, but the point being is that we have that uniformity, right? That's maintained by the recitation of the Quran. However, there's a clear understanding that the interpretation of the Quran is in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So for example, if you were to take a verse of the Qur'an and say the Qur'an encourages domestic violence, it tells you to beat your wives. But then the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says that he never hit a woman or a servant or a child. The interpretation of the Qur'an in Islamic theology is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because if you want to mistranslate something, if you want to take a word or take a verse out of context, I don't care if you're reading Harry Potter Right? I don't care what you're reading, you could turn it into a violent scripture. So the interpretation of the Qur'an starts with the way that it was practiced by the Prophet and his companions, and then, then it goes to scholarship and language, and, and there are certainly verses of the Qur'an that have to be read in context, just like any book in any scripture, uh, so, that they do not be, so that they are not hijacked um, by people that either are... Uh, to be made extreme through it or people that are to try to portray the faith as extreme. So the Quran is sacred to us. It is the word of God. It's the speech of God to us. Um, but there's context, there's interpretation, but we also have principles that govern the interpretation so that that uniformity is still maintained. And I think that's one of the things that we, 
we uh, take pride in there's people praying the same way and reciting uh, the Quran all over the world in different contexts and, and have been doing so for, for over a millennia. How common would the understanding be that Muhammad is, his life is actually sort of the way in which you interpret the rest of it? I don't know that I've heard anyone say it like that before. So this is where 90% um, 90, 90 usually when you hear Sunni Shia you're thinking about Iraq or Iran because that's in the geopolitical terminology that's when it starts to come about um, but the vast majority of Muslims around the world are Sunni which means Sunnah which is the life of the Prophet, the way of the Prophet peace be upon him. What that means is that his life and his words are authoritative. They, they, have, they carry authority and they, they are the first place to go to in interpreting the Qur'an. Um, otherwise, the interpretation is not governed by, any, uh, by, by any, uh, anything that is divine itself. And so we believe that the prophets spoke in a way that was divine and they acted in a way that was divine. So every prophet was infallible in Islam. So the prophets lived the message in the best way, and so you look to them first. And then you have differences, and obviously evolving contexts, and sometimes where some texts might not be applicable. Uh, applicable. So I think that we try to have a balance between the letter and the spirit of the law, you know, try to maintain both, and certainly benefit from the wisdom of other texts, the wisdom of other scholars, the wisdom we, we, we take from uh, stories of the Old Testament and stories of the prophets that came before, but then the authority what is the final authority, if you will? That's, that's where it, it becomes that way. I'm interested to know what David's gonna say here because <laughs> when I listen to you talk about interpreting through the prophet, I mean, I think for, for Christians, where we most often, almost every time, disagree is not what Jesus said or did. It's all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And as a as a, Chris, what do you mean by all the other stuff? <laughs> yeah, what's, well, say, what I stuff mean, are you talking about? Yeah. Well, for example, like <laughs> letters of Paul, okay. right? Where Paul as a, as a, I mean, say a prophet, um, an apostle was planting churches all over the place. And then when those churches would run into trouble or they didn't understand something or someone would ask a question, then they would write to him and then he would write them back. Mm -hmm. And so his letters, in case that's not commonly understood, he's answering a specific group of people in a specific place about a specific question or questions. But what often happens is that specific answer for those people is then extrapolated to everyone in all time everywhere. And it's often where it flies in the face of perhaps what we see about Jesus's kind of radical inclusion right? He always did the stuff that people didn't like. And we naturally, kind of our human nature is to begin to take what is very broad and narrow it. And most of the time, I think if you look back in the way that different denominational groups have split over time, it's often about theology that roots itself in not the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And I often will, in Bible studies, encourage people to say, okay, so you read that, say, in an Old Testament book or in a New Testament letter. What do you think, based on how Jesus lived, that the answer might be? And it's that step of interpreting through the prophet or through Christ that I don't see happen as often as I wish. Can I if, I, if I may here, this is something that reading into, a lot of times we try to read into scripture what's not there, but we want it to be there so badly that we will twist concepts so that, it can, so that we can somehow validate our own approaches and our, our, um, our intentions. And that's very dangerous when you're reading scripture that you either look solely for inspiration when you want to. So the, the Holy Scripture turns into uh, you know, a, a website of quotes. So I'm looking for a good quote for my wedding card. I'm looking for a good quote on keyword searches, yeah, keyword yeah. searches and stuff. Like, which, which now that there is an app for that, there's oh, yeah. an app for the Quran. There's, 
you know, you can, you can literally do that. So I'm looking for a verse on this right now. Yep. But it's not, it's just to give me some sort of inspiration right now or to make me feel good about my situation or to quote at somebody. So rather than religion being a tool or scripture being a tool that humbles me and then instructs me, I abuse it to instruct or judge mm -hmm. or throw at somebody um, without living it at all. The most beautiful description of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that, that I found, and it's challenging, uh, is that uh, his wife was asked after he passed away, she said, how would you describe him? You could describe him in one sentence. And she said he was a walking Qur'an. Mm. That's mm. how she described him. Mm. He was a walking Qur'an. To me, that's beautiful because a lot of times we know this as clergy. There's that great play that was at the... That was at, um, I forgot, I think it was called The Christians, actually. It was about a clergy. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You guys the theater center, yeah. So the, the, the departure, once you're in the public space, especially as clergy, um, you, in, in, in the process of preaching, it's very easy to fall into hypocrisy and very easy to have a different life at home and be perceived in such a different way by, by your family and by those who see you frequently. And I think that's across the board for, for clergy or public figures as a whole. So hearing his wife describe him as a walking Qur'an, that means that he practiced everything that he preached. And to me, that is the ultimate goal, is that this is the standard, this is perfection, this is where I need to get to, whether it's in my family life or in my social life and community life. And there are some times where you read the stories of these sages and you say, well, I can't get there. And sometimes it's actually discouraging, like these stories of selflessness and sacrifice and mercy and compassion that is so far beyond anything that I've ever been able to strive for. So sometimes it's like, well, that was them. And so I'm, you know, I'm not going to even try to do what's in my capacity. For me, the way I read that is, this is the standard, this is what I need to try to attain, this is what I need to try to get to. Though I never will be, I never will be Christ. I never will be Muhammad, I never will be Moses. I can try to be those people. I can try to be those men, and I can try my best to live up to what they did. Um, and so the scripture, the text has to challenge me to get better, not be used by me to make me complacent with my situation or worse uh, to, to, for, for nefarious, uh, you know, for nefarious aims. Um, I'll be a little contrarian. <laughs> um, because I think this is a distinction. First of all, I, to talk about um, Bible study here at St. Michael is to, you have to recognize the history of superb Bible teaching that's taken place in this church. That's the first thing um, of which Chris is, a, a, a discipline which Chris carries forward in, in splendid ways. Um, so I, I want to say that. I, I also should say, which I should have said at the beginning, which is to, on, on Omar's behalf and on my own to thank you all for your hospitality and mm. having us here tonight. Um, certainly better parking here than I get at Temple Manual, so. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I get the trope of uh, Jesus, Muhammad, Moses, but I think to a Jew it doesn't really ring true. Right. Um, for a couple reasons. First, Judaism, for Judaism classically, the incarnation of God is in the Word. And everyone after that is a teacher or interpreter of the Word. I don't walk around telling our religious school kids to emulate Moses, because Moses does some stuff I don't want them to emulate. I don't really think, frankly, the Bible is a book for children. We need to filter it very clearly and closely, whether it's 5% or 2.5% or whatever it might be. I, I knew um, that one would get to Yeah. I, I, no, it's, I'll never forget it. That's okay. No, so, um, <laughs> but, Fine, it was no, but, no, but, part, but, but, this is, but this is to the point that um, not, and I'll, I'll only speak for the Hebrew Bible, which is really the only one I know, um, it is not, it would be a mistake to look at every verse of that document and, and assume it to be prescriptive. Right? When you cite what one army did to another army, which would go into the five and a half percent, have I mentioned that? Which would go, in, which, which would go into the five and a half percent, that's not there as a prescription. It's there as a description through certain human eyes of something that took place, you know, alongside some river between two warring armies. Um, I, I similarly do not read every verse of Moses as something that says, emulate what's happening in this verse. Some verses I do. 
right? Moses is certainly revered in the tradition, particularly for his humility. And so when we talk to kids about humility, we talk about Moses as a model of humility. But I think the idea that the best way to understand the word is how it was enacted by X figure is probably not a Jewish idea. Um, it lends itself to a certain kind of hagiography, which I think Judaism resists. Um, and I believe, so, so, the, I, so now to go back to Amy's question, if you were, to, let's say that each of these traditions has a range from, and I'm not using fundamentalist as a dirty word here, I'm using it as sort of meaning the literalist end of the spectrum of interpretation, right? So let's say each of our traditions has a fundamentalist end of the spectrum, people who read the, the sacred writ with a particular literalist um, frame, and then a more metaphoric, interpretive, liberal reading, let's call it, okay, without attaching any contemporary meanings to those words. Um, the, in Judaism, even the most fundamentalist reader, okay, if you go into the most traditional academy of Jewish study, and you look at a page of scripture that they're studying, literally what you will see is in the center of the page a rectangle that might have six or eight lines of scripture, and then it is completely surrounded on all four sides by commentary. If you can see that picture in your mind, that is how Jews read scripture. That it begins with divine revelation, and then it is not only accessible to, but it depends upon human interpretation to reincarnate what is already incarnate in the word itself. So that's why I would think in general, I'm not saying that Judaism doesn't have its instances of hagiography and holding up people as the best and brightest um, embodiment of sacred call, but in general, um, we're going to look to the word and the application of our own wisdom and the wisdom of the tradition to the word more than we're going to look to specific ind individuals as the embodiment of the word. Thank you. Can I, do sure. we have to go yeah. to the next question? No, we don't. First but... of all, let me apologize for that five and a half No! <laughs> it reminds me of uh, Romney's, uh, what was it, 48% moment? Or, right. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would, this is, a, this is actually one of the things that I actually deeply enjoy um, about our discussion is if, if we're going to talk about it from a purely theological perspective, so how do we reckon with this? I think that every generation is going to be challenged with how much access, how much unique access do you have to text mm -hmm. that previous generations did not? So what emphasis do we place on consensus? Um, so for me, um, you know, looking at every, looking at every Muslim as capable of accessing the text and deriving their own interpretations is very dangerous. I'm not saying that, suggesting yeah, that. Yeah, no, no, I got you. Right, well. right. So there has to be a layer. Now, in Islam, we don't have the hierarchy within the, you know, uh, as a similar to, to, to both of the, the traditions up here, um, that we don't have a hierarchy beyond the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So scholars are judged by the sunnah by the practice of the prophet, not vice versa. So if the Islamic scholar comes and says, I've discovered something that for 1400 years hasn't been there, and this is what it's, all, it's meant all along, and nobody else got it right, then we're not going to take that scholar very seriously. However, contexts evolve, and we also, and I'll say this, just as we look to the past, and this is a really difficult thing for people to swallow sometimes, we love to judge the past and to think that everything and everyone in the past was behind us and that we, we somehow represent this epitome or, or the most refined version of morality now in the 21st century here in the United States. Give me a break. Mm -hmm. Seriously, give me a break. I mean, there's a saying that, that, uh, that if I was, and I gotta get this right because I always mix up the two terms, that I was a conservative 20 years ago and today I'm a liberal and I have not changed a single one of my views. Or no, it's just the opposite. It's the opposite. I was a yeah. liberal 20 years yeah, ago yeah. and today I'm a conservative and I haven't changed a single one of my views. So everything is changing. The way we view morality is changing. The way we view our social contexts are constantly evolving. 
But can we look back and say, everybody in the past had it wrong on this and this and this and that. Now, there are some things that we can say that for sure. All right? But then, just in general, the, the lenses and how we perceive society. And I'll give you, um, you know, when we're talking about the prophets in particular, the prophets of God. So in Islam, we, we would remove any attachment of immorality to the prophets, and we would ascribe that to human innovation, that these were men that came afterwards that ascribed immoralities to the prophets, as opposed to immoralities that the prophets themselves uh, committed. And I think this is where it gets tricky, because if you're, and, and it's a question that we have to wrestle with. Old Testament, New Testament, the God of Judaism, the God of Christianity, the God of Islam, we started off this discussion by saying it's the same God. While laws changed and prescriptions changed, the very nature and essence of God, who legislated and who revealed, was the same God. And so God was, not, was never immoral. God was never cruel. God was always merciful. God right. was always most gracious and compassionate and just. And so legislation that we look back on, or scripture that we look back on, and we go, Eh, either we're misunderstanding it or misapplying it, or we can, I mean, I can say confidently that there are many things that are ascribed to many, to, to the prophets mm -hmm. that I reject as a believer of those prophets, and mm -hmm. I'm offended on their behalf mm -hmm. yes. when, I, when I hear mm -hmm. certain things ascribed to the prophets of the past. So, to, to, so there's, a, there's, an, there's, there's truth to what you're saying uh, in the sense that it's not, well, I, I, I would just push back. It's not the prophets themselves. It's those that interpreted what they wanted to of the prophets. And just like what you had mentioned, we usually get into trouble with the, those that came afterwards. In Islam, we usually get stuck with what some jurist in ninth century Baghdad said. Right, right, right. That's where we usually get stuck. Mm -hmm. Because we want to honor that jurist because he was great in many ways, but then it's like you see that sentence in this book and you're like, ah. Can I, can we just take that out? Can I, you know, well, we don't use white out anymore. We just delete, you know, um, but how do we take that out? So that's where we get stuck as well, usually. I have a, I have a question. What about the, um, what about the potential for an arc of moral growth of one of these figures over time? Is that anathema or is that possible? I wanted to follow up sort of on that idea of immorality. It, it, there, where's, where's their humanity? A prophetic, like the problems that they encounter, the mistakes that they make, as they are human, rather than taking that away as something that was put on them later. Did I hear that right? I think so. In Islam, we the, our our definition of infallibility to the prophets is that they were incapable of major sin or of, of, uh, of ascribing to God um, a partner. So they were capable of mistakes, of slip-ups, of minor sin, but they were not capable of major sin. So that's where, that's where the Islamic definition of prophets, or how we categorize their mistakes as. And you gotta understand that sometimes, when I say I believe in Christ, or I believe in Moses, or I believe in Abraham, that does not mean that as a Muslim I believe in every story about Christ, Abraham, or Moses, peace be upon them all, that is found within Judaism and Christianity. And let's face it, that within Christianity and Judaism, right, there, is, there are different interpretations of who, the, who these men were and who these people were. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm talking too much now. <laughs> but I'm going to just, I, I would just say that that's where it still goes to the men that told us the stories of those prophets, who compiled those stories of those prophets and which stories made it through. And then how were those stories that were told by men interpreted by other men that then reached us? And so that's where, that's where I, would, I would say that we have, to, we have to be as critical of that, or we have to start there before we go to the prophets themselves and say, hey, you know, that, that's something that... Um, that I reject with the prophet himself. You don't agree. So a challenge. <laughs> yes. You, you were the first one. To I knew you guys put me in the middle for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, height, height. That yeah. was the reason. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but um, isn't that a form of sanitizing? In other words, you would use the word, you would talk about sanitizing before in terms of, you know, that we, we whitewash the 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 prophetic injustice anger of these figures. Isn't it a form of sanitizing to say that if there's anything 
uncomfortable that's attributed to the prophet, I'm going to say the problem is in the attribution, not in the prophet. Isn't that in and of itself a form of sanitizing? That's a good question. And I, and I would say that it would be sanitizing if before I look to the attribution, I look to what I like and don't like, and then I toss it out or accept it on that basis. But I will scrutinize every attribution. Got it. Yeah. So yeah. in Islam, we have, you know, we have a very strict method of scrutinizing hadiths. Uh, which are sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. There are some hadiths that are so beautiful, but they're not authentic mm. from an Islamic perspective. Like if I'm true to the science of hadith, and I'm just like, I wish it was authentic because I love it. And I love this attribution. And I love this story, but it's not, it's not something I can ascribe. So as a Muslim, I start from that place. Is the attribution authentic or not? If it is, then what's the context? I want to understand the context because I, I cannot believe that a man who was used as a vehicle of God's revelation himself lived an immoral life. So I need to, I need to look at that. I need to look at the attribution, then, then look at the incident itself. If I've determined that the attribution is authentic, then what is it that took place and how do I, how do I grapple with that particular incident? What I find interesting about this is that for for Christianity, the, the root idea is God's redemptive work in the world, right? And the redemption is a change. Mm -hmm. And so mistakes and problems aren't a problem because it's just true. And we're all in that same boat together. And it's, I, I might steal David's word, that ark that redemptive work over time, not necessarily just a single individual, although yes, there's that too, but it's also as a world, like the idea of a kingdom of heaven is not this other thing, but it's something we work toward now, right? right. That we are working, we are redemptive agents in the world and are called to spread that, that redemptive truth of God. And so to say that even our prophets weren't part of that work, to me kind of undermines, I think, what the Christian kind of root of redemption really is. So it goes to the definition of a prophet in Islam, and then it goes to the definition of what we classify as a major sin. So the story of Adam and Eve is the story of mankind, that Adam, who's a prophet, made a mistake. So the major sin here, when I, when I class a major sin, that, that you know, I'm, I'm talking about murder, I'm talking about the, you know, I'm talking about uh, a different category. There's a very specific category of major sin in Islam, but redemption would occur uh, with all of the prophets, with all of the uh, stories of great people. And, and there are stories of redemption that are told by the prophets themselves. So the, the work of God, the entire, the entire concept of salvation in Islam is that you do your best, but your God is most compassionate, most merciful. And so, so long as he finds you on the day of judgment, having tried your best to attain that mercy, then his mercy will, will overcome your shortcomings. And so there's a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that no one enters paradise by virtue of their good deeds, but instead by the mercy of God. That does not mean free pass, you don't have to do anything. That means you will do your best, you will strive, but you will fall short because you were created in a way that you, you are meant to fall short, but it is ultimately the mercy and the redemption of God that will overwhelm you and enter you into paradise. But that doesn't mean, my point is that the vehicles of God's revelation, the prophets themselves, and again, this would take a lot of deconstruction. Sure. Because who tells us the stories of Christ? Which stories of Christ are authentic from a historical perspective? If we were to take a step back and judge it from a purely objective perspective, Whose story of Christ wins and becomes mainstream? Whose story of Moses wins and becomes mainstream? There are, the, the methods of extraction are different as well amongst ourselves. And so with that, there are certain stories that maybe you're thinking of when I say that you're going, uh. So I'll give you an example. Noah. <laughs> well, give me the story. <laughs> and he was naked and drunk on the beach. We have, so, so, so that... We don't read that part in church. <laughs> so so that, that attribution, from an Islamic perspective, we don't have that attribution in our text of Noah. Ah, there you go. So what would make your attribution more historically accurate than my attribution to Noah? Do you understand what I'm saying here? It's more fun. It's more fun. <laughs> 
And I would, I would, you know, I was, I was talking to a young Muslim the other day. He was talk, you know, we have the story of sacrifice, the sacrifice of Abraham, that Abraham sacrificing his son. Now, uh, Jews say it's Isaac, Muslims say it's Ishmael, yep. but how could a, a, a man sacrifice his son? How could God command a man to sacrifice his son? And the Islamic answer to that is that Abraham saw a dream that he interpreted that way, but that that was not, God never commanded him explicitly, go slaughter your son. And that's where the miracle took place and it was a ram rather than his son. So we don't attribute immorality to the prophets. Mistakes, they made mistakes, but those mistakes would not compromise the integrity of the message that they had. And that's where the, that's where the difference uh, lies, I think. All right, I'm going to pull us back a little bit from the wonderful text this was great. door that I opened. <laughs> not and typical I'm, of oh, a... Oh, my goodness. So much, uh, I wish my husband was here. Um, so, like overhearing geeky theology. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to step back a little bit in some of this, the practicalities. In all traditions, head covering is a part. What does that mean? Why is there head covering in the various forms that it exists within each of the religions for men and for women? And is it only for at times of worship, throughout the culture? What is the role of head covering? Oh, within Christianity, it, it is absolutely about a humility before God. Mm -hmm. No question. I mean, how many of you grew up, I, I grew up Catholic, and I definitely saw my grandmother cover her head when we went to church. No question. You would not go into a church without a scarf or... They kind of look like doilies. I don't know what yeah. those <laughs> were. Mm -hmm. But certainly out of humility. Humility. For being in God's presence. Okay. You ever, isn't it ironic the difference between how a Muslim woman who covers her head is perceived and a nun? Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with the media. That has nothing to do with <laughs> conditioning or engineering. So. Um, I would, look, here's the thing, in our tradition, and, and Muslims loved being asked about their faith and not told about their faith. Mm. Like usually here's how an interaction, interfaith dialogue for me usually is this, walking out of Walmart, you guys, and then it's gone, you know, and it's like, okay, well, we could have had an exchange. That's called the interfaith but, monologue. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have those like six times a yeah. week. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> There are Muslim women that are here today that cover their heads. Ask a Muslim woman how she feels about her head covering and if anyone forced it upon her or if it was a choice that she made at some point in her life as a means of devotion and humility before God. Uh, and I guarantee you that you'll be surprised by the answer. So you have, and I'm actually inviting you, all the sisters, I see a few sisters here, you're, you're good with being asked about your hijab and the story of your hijab, okay, good, you're all good with that. So you may ask them that question, don't ask me that question, and ask, ask those sisters, because when they decided to cover their heads and why they decided to cover their heads. It is in, 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 in this America, in 2018, um, Hats off, literally, to the Muslim women in, in, in this country that insist on their Americanness and insist on their identity because what they are doing is an act of resistance to bigotry because they're insisting that there is no... There, that is an insistence that, no, I will be an accomplished woman I w and, and whatever that accomplishment looks like and I will insist on my religious identity and it is just as oppressive to force a woman to take her head covering off than to force her to put it on. So uh, when you see France and you see a woman on the beach, you know, who's wearing the burkini, God forbid a woman on the beach wearing a, a swimsuit that covers her entire body and her hair because she wants to enjoy the beach, but she also wants to abide by her religious obligations. And you've got police officers going to the beach and humiliating that woman and stripping, you know, stripping her of, that, of, that, of, of her ide uh, identifying cloth and then doing that in the name of secularism and modernity and progress. That's the point. We need to look to it. We need to accuse our own, uh, our own lenses and our own constructs. And uh, I'll let Muslim women speak for themselves as to why they chose to cover and why they, what, what they feel about that obligation. Humility and modesty. Humility and modesty. Um, a question. I, the other thing I throw in is because 
You can do, and I, I assume you could do it in other traditions also, certainly in Judaism you could, if you wanted to be, if you wanted to prejudge, you could look on a bus in Israel and based on the kind of, whether it's woven, whether it's velvet, how big or how small, you could, like people who really know Israeli sociology could actually tell you a lot about a person, right? And, and again, it's a prejudgment, but there's head covering, and then it, it get, like as we said from the very beginning, it's also sometimes used as a sociological marker. Mm -hmm. right. That's great. Well, speaking of sociological markers, um, talk about interfaith marriage. What does each religion say about it? Repeat the question. Yeah. Interfaith marriage. What does each religion say or teach about interfaith marriage? Omar? <laughs> <laughs> I just spoke for like 15 minutes. Yes. Yeah. And you um, guys gave one word answers. So. <laughs> it's, it's a lot harder to say something with just a few words, don't you think? Um, so. <laughs> Is the question what, what our traditions teach about interfaith marriage? Or just say about it. I just it want to point out it's not the rabbi who answered a question with a question. Yes, I, I just want to point out. Yeah. 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 I think it's, I think it's I a sense know. of, my guess is behind the question, having not written it, is this sense of, is it, is it acceptable? Is it okay? Well, uh, in oh, okay. in um, traditional Jewish law, it's prohibited. Okay. In contemporary Jewish practice, um, there are many rabbi, uh, sp specifically rabbis of my denomination who would officiate. You would never find an Orthodox rabbi officiating an interfaith wedding. Um, you would actually, and, and a conservative, currently the current regulation of the um, conservative rabbinic organization is that if a conservative rabbi officiates at an interfaith wedding, they're expelled from the organization. So it's, so it's a strong traditional prohibition in the more um, progressive and liberal denominations that um, there are plenty of rabbis who do officiate. I, I would certainly say that there isn't explicit, te this is one of those moments where I cannot speak for Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, right. I think that in most cases, individual clerics have some flexibility on how they approach this. Um, most of the time, marriage is considered kind of in that pastoral category. Um, certainly as Anglicans or as Episcopalians, and I would say probably Orthodox or Romans, um, it is sacramental. And when a sacrament, when a sacramental moment is shared, that is, a sa that is shared among people who believe in that sacramental experience. Um, however, there is flexibility in that. I think it depends on a personal, in our tradition, we are not compelled to marry anybody. Um, I have declined multiple couples just because, you know, God knows they're not supposed to be married. Um, <laughs> wow. Sorry. Um, I know. So. <laughs> Okay. It, it's different. I mean, I would say that, that we have a, a, a responsibility for to baptize someone who wishes to be baptized, that we have a responsibility to bury someone who needs to be buried, that those are, those are responsibilities that we share. But things like marriage is, I think, a, a reforming of family and starting something new. And most, I would say most Christian clergy would really want to encourage a Christian identity in that new family. Mm -hmm. um, even if perhaps someone did not come out of a tr Christian tradition, that would still be very strongly encouraged, okay. for sure. So um, within the Muslim community, it, it, to the preservation of identity, the Qur'an was revealed over 23 years. So the way we look, the, the, the Qur'an was not revealed in one shot, but rather between the age of 40 and 63 of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And so it was dealing with evolving context as well. Um, when Muslims were in Mecca, which is the earlier part of the revelation, the first 13 years, there was an absolute prohibition on interfaith marriages. So Muslim men and Muslim women uh, could not marry um, 
non-Muslim men or non-Muslim women, and there was also a prohibition on eating meat slaughtered by anyone that was not Muslim. So those are sacrifices, obviously a big part of the Abrahamic story. So the, the sacrifices of others were, was not accepted. When the Muslims moved to Medina, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, moved to Medina, there was a uh, vibrant Jewish community and actually the first constitution in the world, according to some historians, was the constitution of Medina. You could actually look it up where Muslims and Jews agreed upon certain obligations to one another and certain things to each other. At that point, there was a verse that was revealed in the Quran um, that relaxed the prohibition for men, Muslim men, marrying Jewish or Christian women and relaxed or, or did away with the prohibition of eating sacrifice, eating the meat of Christians and Jews. And that was in that new interaction that was taking place. So certainly, even with that relaxation of prohibition on Muslim men being able now to marry Jewish women and, and Christian women, it still was not encouraged. It was discouraged actually very early on in, the, in, the, um, in an effort to preserve the Islamic identity within the marriage. But when it comes to food, thankfully, <laughs> I can eat kosher. Yeah. <laughs> and we got some really good kosher food in Dallas. <laughs> it's better in New Orleans where yeah. I used to hang out with Rabbi Lowy, but um, Muslims can eat halal and they can eat kosher, so they can eat meat that's slaughtered by Christians and Jews as well as um, Muslims. And that got me a little hungry. And we're, we're having dinner after this. <laughs> Is there one requirement to be your faith? Is there one requirement? Or can you think of a requirement to be your faith tradition? Are we doing a conversion right now? Yeah, yeah no. no. <laughs> yeah, in our tradition, it is uh, the testimony of faith, mm -hmm. which is la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, that I bear witness that there is only one God worthy of worship and unconditional obedience, and that Muhammad is his final messenger. And that statement affirms six articles of faith, which is belief in one God and, and uh, monotheism, belief in the messengers and prophets, belief in the scriptures, belief in the angels, belief in the day of judgment, and belief in divine decree and predestination. So that's, those are the six pillars of faith that are implied in the statement. Um, but it's fun to make someone think when they're about to become Muslim that we're gonna also baptize them or we're gonna, we, we've got a pool in the back of the mosque so they kind of, their eyes get really wide. <laughs> and also, when someone becomes Muslim, the way that Muslims celebrate is they say, Allahu Akbar. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't warned the person before they become Muslim that everybody in the mosque is about to chant Allahu Akbar and they've been watching certain news channels, <laughs> yeah. then they get really scared. So that's always, I always try to make it a point to explain like that's how they're gonna celebrate. It doesn't mean they're gonna kill you. It means they're about to come hug you. <laughs> So Christianity is definitely an orthodoxy, um, so it is grounded in right belief, and the belief being that God's redemptive work in the world was made complete through the incarnation of Christ, and that our move toward redemption and salvation is through the belief in Christ, and the rest of it is details that people need to feel good, um, but that is, that's the common starting place. Um, I think Judaism is distinguished here also, uh, tends to put plenty of emphasis on deed as well as on creed. If you wanted to look mm -hmm. historically, um, the Jews are a people before they get to Mount Sinai. So they're actually mm -hmm. identified and behaving as a people before they enter into the formal Sinaitic covenant. Um, in general, what you end up with in later rabbinic Judaism is sort of two core ideas, um, what's called ol ha-malchut and ol ha-mitzvot. Ol ha-malchut is the yoke, Y-O-K-E, of God's sovereignty, and ol ha-mitzvot is the yoke of the commandments. And that one way or another, there has to be um, participation in the covenant in both of those dimensions. So it's, it, is, it is both about accepting a notion of one God in all the world, as well as accepting, in some interpretation, um, a life of mitzvot, of living according to covenant and commandment. Can I just share with you the coolest Muslim t-shirt that's out there? there actually, there's actually a t-shirt 
I cannot be Muslim if I don't believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. wow. It's actually a t-shirt that, that some people wear. So it's pretty cool. Wow, that's great. That's great. So another question um, from our gathering tonight. What is your biggest fear as it relates to your faith in Dallas and worldwide? Wow. Maybe let's focus on Dallas. What is your greatest fear um, right now and where we are? <sighs> Well, we're the only community, well, we're the only uh, Muslim community in America that regularly has white supremacist groups in front of our mosques with long rifles. Mm. That's pretty scary. That is scary. Uh, Jeez. And it's, it's routine, it's routine in our community. There's no other, Texas has 10% of the country's hate groups. We have a lot of hate in Texas. We have a lot of hate in Dallas. And we have had a lot of Islamophobia in Dallas. And we have had my, she turned eight last week. My eight-year-old daughter, all, you know, she asked me the question. She said, if Donald Trump becomes president, are we going to be killed? And so what children are ingesting and internalizing, I'd like to think that, and this is, I think, part of all of our faiths, that we, we, we should work with optimism. That as, as a person who believes in God, I, I can't afford to be pessimistic. We're playing the long game. If we're, if we're preaching inclusivity, we're preaching love and mercy and tolerance and justice and these ideals that for most people, um, even if they are lived, they are not part of the mission of those people. If, if, as people of clergy, of faith, people who believe in God and people who want to make Dallas a more loving city, we have to be willing or we have to believe that we're going to give our children a fighting chance to be able to realize that. I don't think that Dr. King, uh, I don't think that Dr. King really believed that he would achieve everything that he dreamed of in his own lifetime. So for me, this is, this is pretty bad. And with a lot of otherizing, Dr. Greg Robinson, who's the foremost scholar on Japanese internment mm -hmm. in the United States, he, he has a book by order of the president in which he talks about how the Japanese in particular were able to be treated that way as opposed to Europeans that came from countries that were also hostile to the United States. And prevailing racist attitudes allowed for racist policy, allowed for discriminatory policy. What that means is that it was so, it was, it was easier to otherize the Japanese Americans than it was the German-American or the Italian-American or whatever it may be. It was easier to otherize them. So as a Muslim, um, look, it's, in our situation, it is a statistical fact that Muslims do not commit most acts of terrorism, domestically or globally. It's statistical. You can't argue with it. It's objective research data that Muslims do not kill more than other faith groups and that Muslims do not commit most terrorist acts or mass shootings in the United States. However, the way that a San Bernardino is treated as opposed mm -hmm. to a Las Vegas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. puts us in a situation in which we feel like at times we can't win because we have to defend every lunatic that takes one life or 16 lives, whereas other groups of people are given a, a pass even when a person may be claiming their faith or belong to their, 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 their group and could murder 60 people without anyone facing any repercussions for that. And our children have to bear the burden of that. And if you think about how unjust that is, I wrote an article yesterday that went up in CNN, on CNN, um, and, and, it's, and, and it was, I am not your American Muslim. <laughs> And, I'm, and, and to be honest with you, I started off with the last detainee at the airport in DFW was Jesus. His name was Jesus. He was a 33-year-old Iraqi man who served the U.S. military and was named Isa, which means Jesus, and had a, had a broken pelvis because of an attack that he suffered from serving the United States Army. And we held him at DFW, and he almost died out of pain back there because of the Muslim ban one year ago. What does that say about our Christianity? What does it say about our patriotism? What does that say about everything that we claim to hold near and dear? And so it's a losing battle if, in order for a Muslim to be 
dignified. They have to be American with a capital A, a patriot with a capital P, a Democrat with a capital D, or a Republican with a capital R. We're, we're just not willing to live up to those standards because you don't have to like me, but you have to respect me. You, you could hate the Quran, but you've got to treat me in accordance with the Constitution. And so we will insist on our rights, and I pray that we're able to form. I am optimistic because I do think that we're forming coalitions now that we would not have formed in our complacency, that we would not have formed if, if, if the, the myth of a post-racial America continued to persist in the media. And that that, that idea that we're, we've moved beyond all of our rifts and discrimination was able to survive. So I think now the, 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 it's, it's code red, it's, it's raised, mm -hmm. we're alert, and hopefully that radical hatred is forcing radical love. And so I'm optimistic that we'll form coalitions and friendships and relationships that hopefully will give our children a better chance uh, to do away with those divisions. Thank you. Thank you. Here in Dallas, I think that the most dangerous thing for us is that this is a segregated city. Um, I've lived in five major cities, and I've not lived in a place that is so separated. Um, and I think the separation is maybe not bad for the reason you might think, it's, it's exposure. And it's simply just knowing other people. Um, it, it is so easy for me in my world of work and school and grocery stores and whatever, to really only see people who look like me and who might believe like me, way too easy. And when that is the case, then the natural exposure that we have to people who just aren't like us is so low that we can't otherwise. And in places where segregation, where there is a big mix, you just, you kind of have to learn about other people just because they're around you, right? You're working with them, you're shopping with them, you're in school with them, and you figure out that they're just people. And that, that I think for Dallas is, is probably the, hard, the biggest hurdle that we have because geography and physical division is really difficult to get over, really difficult. Um, nationally, perhaps, I think that there is no way to read the story of Christ as a story that is not about incredible, lavish abundance. Abundance, always. And yet, I think that especially Christian groups have not been living abundantly for a while. And when we guard ourselves and are concerned about lack and try to shore up what we have to not lose any of it, we're not actually living faithfully. And that kind of, the abundance of God is so tangible and real that if we don't claim that back, that confidence and that courage and that love that abundance provides and, and empowers us to be, we're not going to grow. We're not gonna be a force for good. We're not going to be able to claim our authority for the good that God calls us to be in the world. And I think that's, that Christian groups, particularly in America, have, have that reckoning that is coming a lot faster than we wish it were. Um, I have a few worries. First is I, I sort of believe that anti-Semitism is a constant. I believe that in some periods and places it's more submerged, which I'm very happy for. Mm -hmm. um, but And I'm really not a sort of Anti-Semitism is not a primary shaper of my Jewish identity. It is for lots of Jews. It's not a primary shaper of my, and I say that without judgment, it's, it's not a primary shaper of my identity, but I have an awareness of it. I have a sense of vigilance about it. I, I think that we've been 
um, relatively fortunate in Dallas, but I sort of don't really take it for granted. Um, and it may sound paradoxical, but the other thing I'm worried about in the sociological category is assimilation. That um, Jewish achievement and Jewish integration get so cushy that we lose track of who we are. Um, as a faith community, as an historic community, as a distinguished uh, and distinctive community. So I worry about that, and I see that as a big part of my responsibility. Um, and I'm going, now shifting away from the sociological towards the more um, explicitly faith dimension of Jewish identity, I, I worry about complacency. Um, I worry that we'll take all the parts that are warm and joyous and connective and self-affirming, which, thank God, there are deep reservoirs of, um, and neglect our obligation to justice, neglect our obligation to enter into the spaces that are uncomfortable, ne neglect our obligation to hear the stories that are uncomfortable, neglect our obligation to see what's broken and to work to be healers of that breach. So um, I, I, I worry that we, um, that we don't rise to the level to which our tradition calls us. Mm, thank you. Can I respond for maybe just faith communities in general? Sure. Um, I think assimilation is an interesting idea to put forward because one of the things, at, I grew up in Florida, which a lot of people call, you know, the sixth borough of New York, and <laughs> I had... We call it God's anteroom. God's <laughs> anteroom? <laughs> <laughs> that is not wrong. Um, <laughs> so we used to have bumper stickers that said, when I am old, I will move to Michigan and drive slow. <laughs> yeah. um, so point being, though, when I grew up, I knew I had lots of Jewish friends. And every Saturday morning, they would trot off to Jew school, right? And they would learn how to speak and read Hebrew. They would learn stories. They Friends of mine who were raised in Jewish families did not make the assumption that they would figure out how to be Jewish unless they were taught by their church, right? By the synagogue or their school or their community center. And I think that one of the differences that Christian groups have to embrace is our culture is not Christian, right? It is... It is, eh, I mean, nominally, there are some words that perhaps culture uses that have Christian roots or, but you know, America was founded to be this place of diversity, right? And of equality. And we have slowly, almost so slowly that we don't even like to admit it, become a place where we still think that people might become Christian just by osmosis of being in America. Mm. Not true. And it has not been true. And it's really basically not been true for any person in this room, right? I mean, it's many generations of not being true. And we have yet, most Christian groups have yet to cop to that untruth. And we do not take seriously enough forming people to be Christian. In the way that I think, my friends up here, their traditions don't make that assumption because they, there is, nobody thinks that just by being in America, you're going to learn how to be a good Muslim, right? Everyone would say, no, no. And so we go to a place where that tradition is passed on and taught and honored and respected in the same way that, that anyone who is Jewish does that. And Christians have got to own that more. And that's a danger because I think as people of faith, all of us will lose if we don't realize the necessity of formation and we just assume it will happen. Thank you, thank you. So, so believe it or not, gentlemen, it's after 8.30. I know, oh, Zoom wow. whoosh, there it goes. So I can't help but end on a wonderful question. I don't know who wrote it. Um, it's kind of a circle back to when we all got together before we came in here. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to upset. The questions tonight have been fabulous. There are many, many others um, that I'm sure we're going to figure out a way to address in communication from this evening. 
Um, but here's the last question. And I did not write it, see? What is the best priest, rabbi, and imam walk into a bar joke that you know? <laughs> should qualify, that can be shared in a mixed yes. room. That can be shared yeah. in, so in this room, room. In, in this, this sacred room. space. This so I, I told them this earlier, I actually, when I pulled into my, to the parking lot tonight, I Googled a rabbi, a priest, and an imam walk in a bar. <laughs> Just because I figured you have to know one of them, right? And I didn't know any of them. And so here's, here's what came up, right? A rabbi, a priest, and an imam walk into a bar. And the bartender looks at them and says, what is this, a joke? <laughs> That's it. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. That's a good one. <laughs> go ahead. I don't have any. You got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. Wow. <laughs> I have absolutely nothing. So, I, w I would think that it would be something about, um, you know, uh, Something about the Muslim being violent, the Imam hitting someone over the head with a with a bottle. You know. <laughs> I think it'd be like something like that, right? Are you sure you don't have one, so, David, now? <laughs> so Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be one of the stereotypes, right? So, right, you know. right, right. But I'm pretty sure it ends with the Imam being violent. I mean it's just gotta be that way. So the Imam's either gonna break the bottle on the bartender's head or or, or, the, or the priest is going to get it, so. And yet, I think we would all agree that often the better conversations for understanding are going to happen in the bars and the restrooms or around dinner tables <laughs> than they are going to be in our segregated places of worship on the weekends. And so maybe that can be the great takeaway is to find ways in our communities to come together around tables, around places where we can engage in conversation and laughter well, and I don't laugh at one another. <laughs> Honestly, I was, I was just going to say, I don't drink, but I'll, but I'll say this, that David has become my favorite coffee uh, partner there you go. very coffee quickly. Shops. So we've, we've, we've done Java Me Up, and that's, Excellent. that's the best we've done, and I've got to bring you that's out true. there as well. So. I love coffee. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we have more in common than we think. That's right. So real quickly, just to end us, um, I want to say a big word of thanks to Amy for moderating us tonight. For David and for Omar for being here with us tonight, and a thank you to all of you, for the women of St. Michael, for everyone who helped put this together. Um, St. Michael is really honored that you were here with us tonight in this sacred space for a sacred conversation, and we hope that it does not end here for you, that perhaps you will stay after for the reception that will be out these doors in our garden cloister, our parlor, and all over the place. Um, stay and have conversation. Look around the church and see somebody you don't know and go meet them and go ask them who they are and why, do they, why are they here, first of all? What do they believe and maybe make a new friend? And perhaps we will all continue this dialogue for good that will begin to change our city and our world. So thank you all for being here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I hope the joke didn't go so good. Thank you. <laughs>